Today's talk is uh, going to be delivered by Professor Barry Roseman, uh, uh, who has recently joined the Schusterman Center as an affiliated faculty member after having done, uh, oh, a whole number of wonderful projects for us in the past. Uh, Professor Roseman is visiting a uh, uh, professor in visual communication with the OU School of Visual Arts, a uh, longtime resident of Atlanta, Georgia, but now hopefully in Norman for, uh, we hope, the, the long haul. He's the graduate of Occidental College, Art Center, College of Design, and a Master of Fine Arts and Graphic Design from Yale. I think that's in Connecticut. Um, in the mid-1980s, he studied for two years uh, in the graphic design postgraduate program uh, in Basel, Switzerland, uh, after working in the field of corporate identity design, especially at the firm Siegel Gale in New York. Uh, I believe that's in New York. Um, he began a teaching career at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and then at the Atlanta School College of Art, which became the Savannah College of Art and Design uh, for those of you who know a little bit about this, which is quite a few people in this room, you'll know that's one of the the best schools in the country. Um, he has been a design educator for 30 years. And uh, most recently, uh, last uh, September, for us, he started it off, uh, he and Professor Carlos Hill uh, kicked off uh, our uh, Schusterman Center Just Lunch series last year uh, with Professor Hill's uh, book, the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, A Photographic History, which was published uh, in 2021 by OU Press. So we're awfully glad that Barry uh, has joined the Schusterman Center as an affiliated faculty member. And we're awfully glad that Barry's here at OU uh, and is staying at least for a while. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce Professor Barry Roseman. Uh, Alan, thank you for that great introduction. Um, uh, so I'm Barry Roseman, visiting professor of visual communication in the OU School of Visual Arts. And um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Alan Levinson for inviting me here today to share my research on two of the most influential American graphic designers of the 20th century, who just happened to be Jewish. Um, Paul Rand, who practiced on the East Coast in New York and Connecticut, and Saul Bass, who developed a significant design firm on the West Coast in Los Angeles. Both helped establish graphic design as a profession in the United States and develop its modern aesthetics in the 20th century. A close examination of their life experiences and work reveals both remarkable similarities and differences. But uh, before I really begin, there's something I would like for you to know. Three of our faculty members in the visual communication area in the OU School of Visual Arts have had close interaction with Paul Rand either in education or in the graphic design profession. I had Rand as a teacher, as an undergraduate, when I attended a graphic design summer workshop in Brazago, Switzerland, sponsored by Kent State University. My colleague, Professor Karen Hayes Thuman, attended the same program, summer program, uh, five years later when it was managed by the Yale School of Art. I later had Paul Rand as a teacher in the graduate program in graphic design at Yale. And my colleague here, Professor Eric Anderson, worked extensively with Paul Rand when he was working for IBM. So I think that's a good reason to be here at OU. So uh, there are some interesting coincidences between these two uh, people and particularly their names. So one interesting coincidence is that both died in 1996. Uh, 
Another interesting similarity between Rand uh, and Bass from a typographic standpoint is that both have four characters in their first and last names. So I guess I could have called my talk Paul and Saul, both designers, descendants of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe grew up in New York City. Both were aware of important art movements and designers uh, of the time, European as well as American, which influenced their work. In addition, the graphic design work of both evolved from their early careers in advertising. Uh, so um, Saul Bass, born 1920 in the Bronx, um, he studied at the Art Students League and at Brook Brooklyn College. So Saul Bass grew up in a home where only Yiddish was spoken. The Art Student League was an unconventional art school where students were instructed by professional art instructors. And to my surprise, it still exists. It is here where Saul Bass enrolled in an evening class layout and design for industry. Uh, but it was at Brooklyn College where he took classes from Jorgi Kapps, um, uh, actually a Hungarian uh, immigrant who was a designer. Language of Vision was a book that featured contemporary American advertising and student design exercises. Uh, Paul Rand was born in 1914 and was raised in uh, the, the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, also in a strict Orthodox Jewish home. So um, uh, in 1936, um, Paul Rand was working for uh, Apparel Arts Magazine, and he eventually became the art director for Esquire, the men's fashion uh, magazine. Um, and his first career is thought of as being media promotion and cover design. Uh, Saul Bass worked for a small commercial art studio that designed trade ads for United Artists, the film company. In the mid-1940s, he worked for the Blaine Thompson Company, a prominent New York ad agency. Uh, so during the 1930s, Paul Rand designed a series of covers for Apparel Arts Magazine, a popular men's fashion magazine owned by the Chicago-based Esquire Coronet Company with offices in New York. Both examples here demonstrate Rand's affinity to photo montage, similar to the trend of several European artists and designers. In order to attain this work, Peretz Rosenbaum had changed his name to Paul Rand. During the 1930s, the sons of immigrants filled many of the bullpens and art departments art departments in ad agencies and industrial design firms, where the majority of account executives, vice presidents, and presidents were drawn from America's dominant Protestant class. Consequently, it was not uncommon for professionals in several fields to shorten their ethnic surnames to fit in. In fact, the name Paul Rand itself became a brilliant symbol and brand. Four letters here, four letters there. What's there not to like? Uh, his success with apparel arts led to more work with the men's fashion magazine, Esquire. He worked for Esquire for three years. Uh, the covers for apparel arts were sophisticated and visually complex, but always with a conceptual idea. He even started to sign his work. 
as one can see in the example uh, on the right. Um, beginning in 1938, Paul Rand produced a series of covers for Direction, a cultural magazine with a left-wing slant and anti-fascist bias. The cover on the left, dated from 1938, was Rand's first Direction cover. The image is no doubt a visual reference to the Nazi military occupation of Czechoslovakia. And on the right, for the cover in December 1940, labeled Merry Christmas, Paul Rand used the imagery of a typical Christmas present in order to portray a theme of war. A typical gift wrap ribbon has been substituted with barbed wire as a visual pun to communicate what was happening during the 1940s. Uh, many design historians view these covers as Rand's most experimental period. For this work, he was not beholden to an agency. Therefore, he had more control over the design. There's no doubt the work transcended conventional magazine cover design. Uh, through his work, uh, Rand communicated his distress of the war period. In the cover on the left, the image expressed Rand's wish for a speedy and devastating blue, a blow to the Nazi machine, a swastika shattered by the V for victory. For the winter issue in 1942, the image on the right, uh, he made an anti-Nazi statement in this drawing of a rat with Hitler's iconic mustache. And for the Christmas issue in 1943, Rand created a montage of three starving children and a sculpture of a falling angel. So uh, Saul Bass in 1946 offered, was offered a position as art director for the Los Angeles office of Buchanan and Company, the fifth largest advertising agency in the US. In 1950, he worked for the agency Foot Cone and Belding owned by Howard Hughes, which held the RKO Studios account. Um, and during this period, Paul Rand, it's known as his uh, second career, which is advertising, because in 1941, he worked for the Weintraub uh, Agency. Um, and uh, in fact, um, uh, he was offered the position of chief art director at the new Weintraub Agency, the first major Jewish agency in New York, in a field traditionally dominated by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Uh, here is another example of Rand's collage technique for the design of a cover for the 1942 calendar for the Isaac Goldman Company. Uh, a printing firm on Lafayette Street in New York. I think today it would be impossible to convince any printing company to have a, cal a calendar cover like this. It's filled with so many meanings, its visual sophistication would be above everyone's head. Um, Saul Bass on the left, uh, while he was at Blaine Thompson in 1945, Saul Bass created this ad for a hair product known as Tylon Cold Wave, which promised the perfect balance. This ad represents how advertising at this time was somewhat brainy, filled with abstract and perhaps esoteric metaphors. And Paul Rand had created this ad for the product Airwick. In both examples, simple silhouetted photo images demonstrate visual power and directness. 
uh, the Weintraub agency had developed an impressive and uh, lucrative client list. Um, and this, of course, is where uh, Paul Rand was working. That list included several consumer liquor products, including Coronet Brandy. Paul Rand created several ads for this product and developed the Coronet Brandy Man, whose head was fashioned out of a snifter. The background dot pattern signified uh, bubbles and was a key element in the campaign. Uh, in 1946, on the right, Rand created weekly ads for Orbox, the department store. Um, and, you know, I've discovered as a result uh, you're an angel in an Orbach hat. And Mr. Rand signed the, uh, the ad. Rand worked on these ads with the copywriter, uh, Bill Birnbach, who later co-founded the trailblazing firm, Doyle Dane Birnbach. P perhaps Rand taught Birnbach simplicity and focus. Um, one of Paul Rand's early trademark designs for corporation was for the Hillbrose Watch Company, a Weintraub client. In those days, one had to wind a watch. And uh, in 1948, Saul Bass designed this cover for Arts and Architecture, a Los Angeles magazine that published the work of several modernist architects and designers during this period. And uh, at the ad agency Buchanan and Company, Bass designed ads for the film industry, including publicity for the films Death of a Salesman, directed by uh, Friedrich Marsh, and Champion, starring Kirk Douglas. Uh, it's fascinating to see the work of both designers for the publicity of the film No Way Out, a controversial 20th century Fox film about uh, racism. So uh, on the left is Saul Bass's design. Uh, on the right is Paul Rand's design. Um, both designers were sought out for uh, this work. Uh, Saul Bass, by 1952, he established his own design practice. In 1956, he was involved in the Aspen International Design Conference, and his design firm was eventually known as Saul Bass and Associates. Uh, during this period, uh, Paul Rand was entering what is thought of as his third career, corporate identity design. And also during this uh, time, he uh, moves to Weston, uh, Connecticut. And it's important for you to know that most of the work that Paul Rand did uh, was at his little studio uh, in Weston, while Saul Bass eventually established a major design firm in Los Angeles that employed over uh, 40 people. So uh, in the mid 50s, Saul Bass became involved in television graphics and being in Los Angeles, he elevated a new art form, the title sequences of films. Simultaneously, a visual identity of the film would usually evolve when he was doing this work. One of his most famous film identities was for The Man with the Golden Arm. Oops, I want to go back. Uh, Bass had also developed a working relationship with the director Otto Preminger, 
during the 1950s and consequently designed the film titles and visual identities for many Preminger films. Uh, on the left, a design for a record co cover album that featured Frank Sinatra as a conductor. On the right, advertising and publicity for Popco Paint Company. So this, these are both uh, works by uh, Saul Bass. Uh, throughout his career, Paul Rand designed many book covers and jackets with great visual and conceptual ideas, including this one on the right, using the letter form R as the central focus for the theme, revolution. Many of these covers made use of his great handwriting. So take notice, my students, fonts masquerading as handwriting don't quite make the cut. I think this is a brilliant cover for Holiday Magazine. Um, actually, this is mistaken. This is a, um, a Paul Rand design. Sorry for the uh, note at the top. Uh, this image, it, I think, is the essence of uh, Paul Rand's uh, playfulness. And um, uh, during this period, IBM, International Business Machines, was eager to have an image comparable to their European typewriter competitor, Olivetti. Rand developed a relationship with Elliot Noyes, an industrial design consultant for IBM, and consequently, the IBM identity evolved. The logo type was a formal relationship between three letter forms in an appropriate way for a company involved with computers, typewriters, and the technolog technological revolution of the mid 20th century. And here is an interesting color manipulation of the IBM logo type used for a corporate uh, book hopper. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, Saul Bass continued uh, to do a lot of work associated with Otto Preminger's films, including Bonjour uh, Tritesse. This is a record cover for the film's soundtrack. Perhaps the work in this area that gave Saul Bass much fame in the film industry was the identity and film titles he created for Preminger's film, Anatomy of a Murder. He also did the publicity and film titles associated with Exodus. Despite the strong image for John Sturgis' film, the Magnificent Seven, this work was never used. It was too radical for an action-packed Western featuring major stars. Uh, and here is a brilliant uh, book cover design for Philip Roth's novel, Goodbye Columbus, um, uh, created by Paul Rand. And on the left, you can be sure that it's Westinghouse. The logo was designed in 1960, and uh, the original good UPS logo is on the right. Uh, ABC, another brand logo that has endured the test of time. Formally, there is a circular theme throughout all the letter forms. The first major corporate identity project that Saul Bass and Associates acquired was for Alcoa, the aluminum company of America in 1961. The new symbol was unveiled in 1963. 
Uh, Bass continued to create identities for premature films, such as Advice and Consent, and Bunny Lake is Missing. In 1966, Paul Rand was invited to submit a proposal to redesign the identity for the Ford, Mor Ford Motor Company. Uh, and during this period, a lot of major corporations in America wanted to get on the modernist design bandwagon. Um, Rand felt that the current logo uh, was too old fashioned and did not represent the technology of the time. Rand created elaborate printed books for all of these uh, corporate identity projects that he had uh, to explain the design process in great detail uh, to the client. I think he created a brilliant modern interpretation of the original logo. Uh, as you can see, the Ford logo, though, has not progressed so much 56 years later after Rand's presentation. And in 1967, the 13 stripe IBM logo was introduced as a means of updating the corporation's identity. Uh, so, Professor Anderson, would you like to comment on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, go back to the UPS logo. Oh, okay. Sorry, you should never ask me to. I'll take it over. It's like the UPS just, and this is just tells you a little bit about Iran. The original UPS logo that he had on the board that was never published was just the letter forms, uh, the UPS down below, and then the badge and. And he was terribly dissatisfied with it. And so he's in his uh, house and his, his daughter was uh, seven and he takes her over and says, uh, what do you think of this, honey? And, and uh, she takes uh, a look and she says, oh, UPS, he's the birthday man. And so she, her relationship to UPS was around her birthday, the UPS guy would come to the door. And that's where that little package comes from at the top. Just a little charmer. What happened is Slick Corporate America took it over and got rid of the package. Unforgivable. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. So um, Continental Airlines was a relatively small airline in the 1960s that flew primarily in the Western states. But it was competing on the busy Los Angeles to Chicago route with the big three at the time, uh, United, American, and TWA. It was the only airline to use gold as a corporate color. And Saul Bass recognized the visual asset of the golden tail. Uh, and I have to tell you that on the left, the timetable cover uh, is from my own personal collection. Um, he created a great visual transformation of the livery uh, for the aircraft. I think this is just absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, Saul Bass also, uh, their office, uh, created a beautifully uh, designed printed timetable for Continental. Uh, and if you notice, um, it included a symbol for every city listed in it. Uh, so that's just fascinating to me that the designers would take the time uh, to produce that. Uh, by now, Saul Bass and Associates was a major player in the corporate identity business, which was previously concentrated in New York 
and with one other firm in San Francisco, which of course was uh, Landor Associates. Here is the Bass logo for the Bell system, demonstrating extreme graphic simplification and abstraction. Uh, and here is a poster for the environment by Saul Bass with a compelling conceptual uh, idea. Uh, and in 1972, the eight-striped IBM logo uh, was introduced. Uh, and here are some images actually from a, um, a corporate standards manual uh, for IBM. And you can see all of these various uh, renditions of the logo, particularly the solid uh, uh, logo on the left. And uh, a corporate alphabet was created to um, uh, supplement the entire uh, corporate design uh, program. Uh, and here you can see a lot of the uh, applications throughout the years regarding the uh, IBM packaging. Uh, Paul Rand also uh, designed a a uh, uh, new, new identity for Cummins Engine Company, which was headquartered in Columbus, Indiana. And actually the uh, CEO of Cummins uh, was very active uh, from what I gathered uh, in the Columbus, Indiana uh, community. And uh, consequently, um, a lot of major architects uh, were commissioned to create interesting architecture uh, in the town. So Paul Rand was asked to design uh, brochures and uh, an architectural tour map for uh, Columbus, Indiana. And I think this uh, represents uh, a lot of the playfulness um, uh, in his uh, graphic design work. And in 1974, uh, Saul Bass uh, and Associates designed a new identity for United Airlines, given the success of the Continental uh, program. Uh, I know internally at United, the symbol was known as the tulip. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the tulip had to be flipped on the other side of the tail uh, to work, and the tulip was used uh, uh, for a very long period, and it went through several different uh, renditions uh, for United's identity. Um, Saul Bass also designed uh, the identity and film titles for the film uh, The Shining, uh, in 1980, which was a, a Stanley Kubrick uh, film. Uh, and in 1984, Saul Bass designed uh, the new, uh, new identity for AT&T on the left. Uh, on the right is this horrible uh, AT&T uh, logo that uh, was later created which was such a strange idea of trying to take a two-dimensional design, making it three-dimensional, but yet it is still two-dimensional. Uh, and in 1984, uh, that was the year of the um, Olympic Games in Los Angeles, and Saul Bass designed this uh, poster for the Olympics, which I think is fantastic. And uh, I think it was it was uh, designed before the age of Photoshop. So uh, it would be interesting to know exactly how he did that. Um, and um, UCLA uh, extension, uh, uh, which is kind of an adult education program uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, 
employed various uh, well-known designers to design covers for their literature. And uh, Saul Bass designed this wonderful cover on the left, uh, which again, I think really represents his um, uh, playfulness, but also his deep conceptual thought. He had such a great talent uh, for this. And I think the poster on the right uh, from 1993, also for UCLA, is such an interesting, simple statement um, about uh, uh, education. Uh, and this is a, a poster that uh, Paul Rand designed for uh, Earth Day. Uh, this dates from 1995. And unfortunately, Paul Rand died in 1996. And uh, this is his uh, tombstone. So I just want to show you one thing, and uh, I'm going to get get some help uh, to do this. Uh, but one thing I want to say is that there is so much more to uh, all of these two designers. I have presented to you, uh, you know, just a very small percentage of their work that they did as their uh, So I'm sharing with you my very favorite movie set. Ready? Yes. But uh, those of you uh, uh, who, if you're familiar with the film Psycho, uh, Saul Bass not only designed those titles, but he was consulted for the shower scene and worked with uh, Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock uh, on that. So, so that's all. So thank you very much.